This video is a continuation of the previous video where we looked at an air source heat pump being used for a heating application. In this video, we're still looking at our reversible air source heat pump, but this time we're going to consider how it can be used for a cooling application or an air conditioning application. So first of all, we have schematic diagrams and we have pressure, volume and temperature entropy diagrams. Now, the first difference that we notice is that this time our condenser is placed outside and our evaporator is placed inside. So in effect what we've done is we've reversed the direction of the refrigerant through the cycle. Now in practice this can be done using a reversing valve or similar. So we still go through our compressor from position 1 to position 2 and from position 2 to position 3 is still our condenser. The difference here is that the condenser is placed outside so our refrigerant loses energy to the outside air. Now in doing so that refrigerant is going to cool down. So we have a relatively cold vapour entering our expansion valve and when we expand that vapour further its temperature is going to drop. So we see the exit to our expansion valve at position 4 is our lowest temperature position in the cycle. What that means then is when that very cold vapour enters the heat exchanger in the room it's going to heat up. And the way that it heats up is by drawing heat energy out of the room. So in the evaporator this time, which is positioned in the room, we have heat energy being given up by the room and passed into the refrigerant. The heating of the refrigerant results from the cooling of the room or heat energy being given up by the room. And then we re-enter our compressor so that the cycle can continue. So if we refer to the descriptive question underneath, we have the reversible air source heat pump described previously or in the previous video, can be used for air conditioning by reversing the flow of the refrigerant as we mentioned before. When the air source heat pump is being used for air conditioning, the condenser operates at the lower pressure of 950 kilopascals and the evaporator operates at 180 kilopascals. Note that our condenser this time is positioned outside and our evaporator this time is positioned inside the room. The mass flow rate through the system and all other conditions remain constant. Now I've made a note in the top left hand corner of the mass flow rate from the previous video expressed to six decimal places, 0 0.192233 kilograms per second. And we're going to be using that value later in this video. So what are we actually asked to do? We're asked to determine the rate at which heat is removed from the room, the rate of work done by the compressor, as well as the coefficient of performance for the system when operating in this mode. Well, we know that we can only determine each of those things when we first determine our enthalpy at positions 1 to position 4. We know that from our previous videos and our previous examples. We're then asked to determine the rate at which heat is removed from the room. Well, the rate at which heat is removed from the room is the rate at which heat energy is gained by our refrigerant. So this time we need to determine phi in. That occurs in the evaporator in the room. We're going to calculate the new work done by the compressor or rate of work done by the compressor and hence the coefficient of performance for our air source heat pump when it's operating in reverse or providing a cooling effect. So some of the additional information we know from our question there is that our higher pressure or P3 and P2 equals 950 kilopascals. P2 equals P3, 950 kPa. And we know that our evaporator operates at 180 kilopascals. Well, the entrance to our evaporator is position 4 and the exit is position 1. And once again, we see the pressures at position 1 and position 4 are the same. So P1 equals P4, this time 180 kilopascals. So we're going to go through exactly the same process. We're going to determine H1 and we're going to determine S1. We know that H1 is Hg at our lower pressure. And we know the same for S1. We know that S1 is Sg also at our lower pressure. The reason we're determining the entropy at position 1 is because referring to our temperature entropy diagram, the entropy at position 1 is identical to the entropy at position 2. We can use that information to determine our enthalpy at position 2. 
So let's go to our thermodynamic properties tables for the refrigerant R134A and determine our values H1 and S1 at a pressure of 180 kilopascals. So here we are on page 6 and I've already highlighted our pressure column and I've also highlighted our dry saturated vapour enthalpy column and our dry saturated vapour entropy column. Now we know that we have a pressure of 180 kilopascals. So as we go down that column, we have a pressure of 177.89, which corresponds with a temperature of minus 13 degrees C. And here we have a pressure of 185.22, corresponding with minus 12 degrees C. So our pressure of 180 sits somewhere in between those two values. We're also going to highlight our enthalpy values and we're also going to highlight our entropy values. Now I'm going to transfer all of those values back across to our workspace so that we can determine our enthalpy and our entropy at a pressure of 180 kilopascals. Okay, so I've already done a couple of things here. First of all, I've transferred all of my values. So the pressure, enthalpy and entropy corresponding with our temperature of minus 13 degrees and our pressure, enthalpy and entropy corresponding with our temperature of minus 12 degrees. I've also determined the decimal distance for our 180 kilopascals along the continuum between 177.89 kilopascals and 185.22 kilopascals. If you're unsure how to do any of that, then please refer to the previous video. So picking up at this point here, we know that the difference between our upper and lower enthalpy values of 391.1 and 391.7 is 0 0.6. So for our enthalpies, I've already written the sum 0 0.6 times 0 0.28786. And when we run that through the calculator, we get a value equal to 0 0.17. So the distance here represents an enthalpy of 0 0.17. But we need to add that to our lower enthalpy values to find the enthalpy corresponding with 180 kilopascals. When we do that, we get an enthalpy of 391.3. I've already determined the entropy value corresponding with the shorter line there. And once again, if you're unsure where that value has come from, then please refer to the previous video. Now, the difference here and the point I wish to know is that 1.7363 is the larger of these two entropy values. So in order to ensure that our entropy value is between 1.7363 and 1.7356, we actually need to subtract the 0 0.00020. Now that's going to give us an entropy of 1.7361. So on our left hand side now, we know that H1 equals 391.3 kilojoules per kilogram. And we know that S1 and S2, so S1 equals S2, equals 1.7361 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So for position two, we know that we have superheated vapor by referring to our TS and PV diagrams. We know that we have a pressure of 950 kilopascals, and we know that we have an entropy of 1.7361. So therefore we can use our superheated tables at 950 kilopascals in order to determine H2. Okay, so here we are on page 38 of our thermodynamic properties tables. We have a pressure of 950 kilopascals, and we're looking for an entropy value of 1.7361. Well, we can see that 1.7361 sits between 1.7220, which corresponds with a temperature of 40 degrees, and 1.7391, which corresponds with a temperature of 45 degrees. Therefore, we know our enthalpy sits somewhere between 421.4 and 426.8. Now, as normal, we're going to transfer those values over, and we're going to use linear interpolation to find the corresponding enthalpy value, which correlates with an entropy value of 1.7361.
Okay, so as previously, I've transferred all of the information across for my temperature of 40 degrees and the corresponding entropy and enthalpy values and the temperature of 45 degrees and the corresponding entropy and enthalpy values. I've also found the corresponding decimal, which locates our entropy of 1.7361 between our lower entropy value of 1.7220 and our upper entropy value of 1.7391. So we're 0 0.82456 along that continuum. Now the difference between our upper and lower enthalpy values here is 426.8 minus 421.4, which is an enthalpy range of 5.4, but we're only 0 0.82456 along that continuum. So multiplying our 5.4 by the fraction gives us 4.45 to two decimal places. And adding that onto our lower enthalpy value gives us a corresponding enthalpy value equal to 425.9. Therefore, over on the left-hand side, we know that H2 equals 425.9 kilojoules per kilogram. So next we can find H3, and we know that H3 equals HF at our upper pressure of 950 kPa. We know that because position 3 corresponds with our upper pressure and we're also sitting on the wet saturated vapour line here. So once again, returning to our tables. So once again, I've highlighted our pressure column for our saturated vapour, and I've also highlighted our HF value, because this time we have wet saturated vapour. We were sitting on the wet saturated vapour line. We have a pressure of 950. Well, we can see that 950 sits between 938 and 964. We have corresponding temperatures of 37 and 38, and our enthalpy values are 251 and 253.6. So again, we're going to transfer that information across. We're going to determine our enthalpy at position three and four, and then we can carry out our final calculations. Okay, so this time I've transferred my pressures and enthalpies corresponding with 37 degrees and my pressures and enthalpies corresponding with 38 degrees. I've found the decimal which locates our pressure of 950 between our lower limit of 938.2 and 964.14 and that decimal was found to be 0 0.45490. I've then found the distance between my upper and lower enthalpies to be 1.5. Therefore, the distance for our desired enthalpy is 0 0.68, which was found by multiplying our decimal by our 1.5. And all that's left to do is to add that onto 252.1 or our lower enthalpy value. Well, when we do that, we get an enthalpy of 252.8. So over on the left hand side, H3, which we also know equals H4 because the expansion is a throttling process or a constant enthalpy process. Therefore H3 equals H4 equals 252.8 kilojoules per kilogram. So all that remains then is to calculate thigh in, P in, and then we can find our coefficient of performance. Well, thigh in is the rate of heat energy into the refrigerant. Now recall this is the rate of heat that's being lost or transferred away from the room. We have the exit of the evaporator H1 and we have the entrance of the evaporator H4. We have our mass flow rate from the previous part of the question, 1922.33 multiplied by H1, 391.3, minus H4, 252.8, giving us a rate of heat energy into the refrigerant or away from the room equal to 26.62 kilowatts. We know it's kilowatts because each of our enthalpy values there are in kilojoules per kilogram. P in is m dot, D 
the exit of our compressor is H2 and the entry is H1. 0 0.192233, H2, 425.9. H1, 391.3, giving us a rate of work done by the compressor equal to 6.65 kilowatts this time. So finally then, our coefficient of performance this time is the cooling effect on the room, or the rate at which heat energy is gained by the refrigerant, 26.62 divided by the rate at which work is being done or the rate at which power is being consumed by the compressor, giving us a coefficient of performance this time equal to 4.0 accurate to one decimal place. So once again, just to summarize, in the previous video, we looked at an air source heat pump being used for a heating application. And here we've been investigating an air source heat pump being used for a cooling application. The way that those two processes differ is that the refrigerant is traveling in the opposite direction. So therefore, when the air source heat pump is being used for a cooling application, the refrigerant gains heat energy when it travels through the room, and it loses heat energy when it travels to the outside heat exchanger. We determined the enthalpy values at each of our positions, one to four, and then we were able to determine the heat into the refrigerant, or the heat being lost by the room, the work being done by the compressor, or the rate at which the compressor is doing work on the refrigerant. And finally, we was able to determine the coefficient of performance for our air source heat pump when it's being used for a cooling application or an air conditioning application. So I hope you found this video useful and thanks for listening.